Hello, everyone, and welcome to the February meeting of the Global Health Youth Organization. My name is Noraldine, and I'm a co-founder of the organization. We are very excited to see everyone who joined us today. We want to thank everyone for joining the meeting and working around any scheduling or time zone issues that you might have had. As for the format of today's meeting, we'll begin a, uh, with a quick introduction of our speaker, followed by her presentation and then a question and answer session. After the Q&A section, we will post a shadowing certificate link in the chat, and we ask that all members stay muted throughout the presentation so that we can limit interruptions and distractions. Please feel free to add any questions or comments that may arise in the Zoom chat. And I'll now be passing it over to Adam, the other co-founder of the organization, to introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Noor. Hello, everyone. And as Noor mentioned, I'm a co-founder of the organization. It is so, so great to see all of you that joined today. And um, we're really, really thankful they were able to work around the holidays, work around, uh, we know most of you are on break right now. So we're really, really thankful they were able to join the meeting, especially now. Um, we want to once again thank Dr. Winger for taking the time to present today. To quickly provide an introduction, Dr. Winger is, is an associate professor of biological sciences at the University of Notre Dame. Dr. Winger will primarily be speaking on her work on creating new therapies to treat kidney birth defects and adult disorders with regenerative medicine. Please remember to stay muted throughout the duration of the presentation to minimize distractions. Again, if any questions do arise, please type them in the chat and we will get to answering them at the end of the presentation. With that being said, we are now hand the floor over to Dr. Winger for a presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Noor. I will just um, adjust the window to just show the active speaker, just to um, try to enable you to see as much of the slide as possible. Um, interesting, I don't see me, I see Adam. I'm not sure if that's working the way I wanted it to work. Um, Interesting. Oh, okay, fantastic. Thank you. By the time we know, I know how to work Zoom, we won't be using it as much anymore. There'll be a new platform. So thanks for your patience on that. Um, so greetings, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, be sharing some time with you today and to talk to you a little bit about um, kidney biology, kidney health, um, and um, the issues that um, we face um, across the world uh, with regard to, to, to kidney health and congenital diseases. So my uh, research lab and my work is all centered at the University of Notre Dame, which is located in Notre Dame, um, Indiana, uh, in the United States. And I've been uh, a faculty member here at Notre Dame for uh, the past 12 years. And so it's been my pleasure to uh, to launch my lab here, to continue doing research um, here, um, and to teach courses. I teach courses in topics ranging from physiology to stem cells um, and development. And you'll see um, that those same threads um, are um, all throughout the type of research that I do as well with my lab. Okay, so uh, what I'll talk about today um, is to um, first um, tell you a little bit more about um, kidney function and kidney diseases. And um, the other major topic that I'll share with you is how zebrafish, which are these animals shown here in the video, um, how they're a really great model organism to study how the kidney develops and to um, get new insights into um, kidney diseases um, and um, how they can undergo this really fascinating uh, phenomenon of different types of kidney regeneration. And um, we're, it's our hope that by understanding this process, uh, we could facilitate some of the same um, outcomes in people to improve, um, improve the uh, trajectories of different types of kidney diseases. Okay, so I know we have a diverse background, a diverse audience here. And so I wanted to start um, very simply with reminding everyone that we are all comprised of building blocks known as cells. These are the, the fundamental units that make up our bodies um, across the animal kingdom and plant kingdom as well. Um, and so these uh, structures are um, extremely essential and there's a tremendous diversity in cell types um, in our body. So um, the picture shown here is, is illuminating some of the different uh, substructures within a cell. So we have really one cell here that I'm um, uh, 
that I'm outlining with the cursor and the circular component in the very middle um, is uh, the nucleus and the cell is about to divide. So you can actually see that the chromosomes are condensing here and there's the beginnings of uh, spindle where, which is the, the architecture that would be used um, for this cell to actually undergo uh, cell division. So these cells are, our cells are comprised of, of these particular components. And of course, many others that will provide uh, cells with unique functions across our bodies. And so again, cells are the building blocks across the plant and animal kingdoms. Um, and they are what we're gonna have in common, whether we're talking about a fish or a mouse or um, a person. So when we um, think about cells in our bodies, uh, there's not just one kind of cell, uh, there are several hundred different kinds. Depending on the, the critter, there are between, um, on average, 150 to 200 unique specialized cells that are uh, the building blocks of the body. And on this slide are just a couple examples um, to highlight how, um, how different cells can be with regard to their shapes and structures and the components that make cells up will enable them to have uh, very uh, particular biological functions, whether they enable movement, such as muscle cells that have um, huge numbers of proteins known as actin and myosin um, that are arranged in, in orderly ways so that these cells can, um, can um, contract and expand their size. Um, other cells, which are specialized for uh, movement and cruise around our, our bloodstream to, to carry and exchange gas. Um, cells that will produce very tough um, matrices around them to provide ways that our bodies can be supported, um, such as bone and cartilage. And, and of course, other cells that will be uh, specialized to store materials um, or to um, uh, provide us with ways to observe our environment and interact with it and um, to um, create thoughts and memories. And so um, these cells in our bodies Again, there's hundreds of them and they're all beautiful and amazing structures, but um, the fundamental flaw with cells is that they don't live forever. They are um, unfortunately units that can um, undergo uh, any, any number of, of damages and actually be destroyed. And when they're destroyed or they're not functioning correctly, um, this is associated with um, the pathology of diseases in our bodies. So um, one way that I like to uh, frame this um, topic for people is with the following question. And that is, if our cells are destructible, one of the key medical um, challenges that we face as, um, as, a, as a society is you know, how can we understand the mechanisms of how cells are born, how they might be reborn, you know, new ones made over our, our lifetimes, um, and how, if we can understand that, um, can we um, utilize that knowledge to, to treat different types of, of diseases and, and conditions, whether it's something we're born with, so congenital defect, um, or something that we acquire over our life uh, because of you know any number of uh, of things that happen to us in the in the process of living, whether it's you know, redox damage or ultraviolet light um, or uh, a car accident where you you know damage an organ. So so many things can happen to cells as we live um, that um, these is really a central um, challenge for humanity is trying to really tackle um, ways to um, promote cellular health um, in our bodies. So um, in the case of, of my work and um, the work of my graduate students and undergraduates, what we're focused on is the kidney. Um, and I'll tell you more about that as I go. Um, and we utilize, um, as I um, previewed at the very beginning, um, a small animal, a vertebrate model. Um, that's a fish. Um, it's called the zebrafish because of these stripes that um, are uh, covering its body, um, not they, they tend to have a, a blue and green kind of sheen to them. So often people say, oh, that doesn't really actually look like a zebra. It's not black and white, but it's the notion that they are striped uh, is where their, their name comes from. Um, and so we utilize these animals because um, as I'll share, um, although they're a fish swimming around in water, and so they're an aquatic animal that's actually a freshwater species. Um, although that is um, at first blush, very different from humans that are walking around on land, um, our innards are very, very conserved. So the ways that our bodies are constructed, our body plans, how those come about, and the, uh, the genetic pathways that 
um, provide the directions for how you make cells, this is something that's very, very similar across animals. Um, and this vertebrate species provides a number of, has a number of attributes that allow us to investigate certain questions. So um, we utilize this animal model to try to understand that question of how do cells come about? What makes a cell um, a cell? How does it, you know, how does a stem cell give rise to, to various um, progeny cells and how do they become unique, uh, uniquely specialized for different uh, physiologies, um, we utilize this animal to look in the, the natural environment and look in vivo um, at those kinds of questions. Okay, so uh, before I go into um, the type of research and the findings that I'll talk about um, today, um, I want to remind you about um, first about what the job of our kidneys are. So this organ um, is essential because it's necessary to clean our bodies on a regular basis. And so the kidney um, does this job by uh, these functional units shown here uh, with this gray um, lines, this sort of maybe looks like some kind of a worm or something, but this is the, the what we refer to as the structural and functional unit um, of our kidney. So actually to start our kidneys over here on the left, um, this is a, a very simple diagram of simple cartoon of a human kidney, which is I mean, each of us about the size of your clenched fist. So if you imagine that organ, um, it's in the, um, um, in the body, we have a pair if they're formed correctly. And within that um, organ, we have anywhere from several hundred thousand to estimates um, range of 1.2 to 1.8 million of these pipes in that, um, um, in that structure um, that are referred to as nephrons. And these um, are groups of cells that are organized um, into um, what's known as um, a epithelial structure, an epithelial tube. And so if we were to take a cross section of what this tube is comprised of, we've got a single layer of cells that um, are formed um, so that they are um, um, enclosing a space. So they'll have a lumen inside. This is a place where the, the kidney will actually be collecting fluid from the blood. So you see this blood filter that interfaces um, and interacts with one side of the nephron with the proximal side. So this nephron will collect fluid from the blood and then it will modify it selectively. So the nephron, the cells that are um, comprising this tube along its length, um, they're not equivalent. So um, this is why, although I have them drawn here first in gray to show you the structure, what they really um, are, are much more akin to is the, the structure here on the right, where we have different regions of cells with these different colors is what the, the colors demarcate. Uh, we have different regions where these epithelial cells have unique characteristics. So they will physically look a little different um, whether you, if you compare cells in a proximal region, say to a distal region, um, and they have unique gene expression signatures. So uh, as we go along the length of this tube, I've just got a couple of example uh, structures of the cells um, illustrated here um, to provide you a sense of the fact that there are unique shapes and sizes to these cells. And because of the genes they express, they have different um, jobs they perform in the process of regulating um, and modifying this fluid we've collected from the bloodstream. So ultimately the kidney is going to be um, collecting nitrogenous waste from all the metabolism that our body is doing and disposing of that in a fluid that we refer to as urine. But when the, the nephron collects this fluid, um, it's going to be uh, the cells that the um, that the fluid will pass by, um, these cells are all gonna do different tasks to reabsorb or to secrete various kinds of molecules that will enable our body to regulate uh, the amount of water in our body, to regulate the different amounts of, um, of, of salt, for example, of sugars, amino acids, um, acids and bases. Um, and so these different groups of cells within the nephron all do a different job. And um, when I first got interested in studying the kidney, when I uh, began my, my postdoctoral research, I was fascinated by the, the sheer number of cells here, but also the fact that there were very 
few things known about how these different cells are made. So they have a lot of similarities, but they're, they're unique. You've got you know, over a dozen cell types just in these nephrons alone. Um, and um, understanding how you make each of these cells has um, a lot of relevance to um, the, the medical conditions which affect kidney health um, from birth um, through adulthood. And so uh, when we're born, uh, there can be, unfortunately, uh, a range of different defects that can occur um, uh, during the process of gestation. And so uh, sometimes kidneys are not induced correctly. So their children are born without one or, or both kidneys. Um, these kidneys could be very small. They could have a very reduced number of nephrons. The nephrons could have different types of malformations and not be uh, patterned, we would say patterned in the correct way. So uh, a number of categories of conditions will influence what does that kidney um, look like at the time of birth. Uh, but then as we live, we can accrue, um, unfortunately accrue um, many different types of injuries within the kidneys themselves. So you can have a, what's known as um, acute kidney injury. This is a very, um, this is a category of disease where there is widespread and sudden loss of kidney function. So um, a huge percentage of the nephrons stop functioning correctly and the body um, goes into a period when that kidney um, is, um, is functioning very, very poorly to remove waste from the body. Um, sometimes in people, um, this is an episode that they bounce back from. Uh, so for example, a person admitted to um, an ICU uh, might have um, the necessity to, per to, um, um, to be given uh, materials such as antibiotics to fight an infection that, um, that they um, um, that they've acquired. And this kind of uh, regimen of drug treatment, uh, those um, drugs used to treat um, and combat the bacteria can injure broadly kidney cells and lead to this interruption in kidney function. And um, in some cases, people will be able to overcome that. Their kidney function will return either very quickly or in, in the weeks that follow. Um, and um, and one of the questions, and I think I'm going to say a little bit more about this as I go on, um, is you know, why there are differences in outcomes in people when they have acute kidney injury. So I'll come back to this topic a little bit more um, in a few minutes. Um, but the other major category of kidney disease um, in juvenile and adult stages is um, falls under this umbrella of chronic kidney disease. So these are uh, conditions where there is uh, what we call progressive injury to the kidney. So over time, injuries accrue. They become um, um, more and more extensive within the kidney itself. Um, and typically this is associated with um, scar formation and the loss of um, kidney function. So you end up with aberrant groups of cells that are in these um, kidneys and what we would call fibrosis where the kidney um, is accumulating um, cells that it shouldn't normally accumulate. Um, and uh, this impedes and interferes with uh, the nephron um, uh, function and health, and you'll have loss of, of nephrons and alterations in how they can actually function. So, um, so just to sort of um, step back from these, um, these examples, you know, what all of these types of conditions have in common is that in some way, the, the function at the nephron is, um, 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 is altered, uh, whether you don't have a nephron at all or whether it's compromised in some other way. So uh, in terms of um, the world, what are we talking about in terms of the numbers of folks, of humans who are affected with these kinds of conditions? Uh, certainly these conditions affect animals as well. Um, we have a less of an understanding of that, um, but unfortunately, it's not just humans that are affected by this, this spectrum of uh, pathologies. Uh, what, what I can say about the global incidence of these um, is the following. So um, when I started my lab um, in 2010 at Notre Dame, the global estimates were that one in every nine people suffered, um, were, were, were to suffer or were suffering from a kidney condition. 
Um, typically, uh, the numbers are the most accurate for chronic kidney disease. So some of the other conditions we don't have as, as good numbers on at present. Uh, but this was the, um, the, the statistic back in 2010. Um, and my lab actually took uh, pictures of, of, of themselves when we did these silhouettes because it drove home to us that, you know, in my lab, which at the time um, was, I, I think we had 10 or 12 people in the lab. It was startling to me to think about, my goodness, one, one of the people working on, on trying to understand the kidney um, in their lifetime is going to be affected by the types of things that we're actually trying to understand. Um, unfortunately, the, the rate of kidney diseases across the globe has been on a steady incline. Um, and so um, if we fast forward to today, the number is now one in seven is the projection of number of folks across the globe that are impacted um, by, uh, by suffering from one of those kinds of kidney disease. So it's really important that we have um, continued research in this area and that we continue to make inroads into understanding um, the kidney from its basic development to trying to identify um, interventions to treat these types, of, um, these types of conditions. Okay, so if we go now back to uh, that topic of acute kidney injury, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that and um, how we and others, uh, not just my lab, but others as well, um, utilize zebrafish to try and make headway in understanding um, this category of disease. So here we've got uh, that kidney picture again, that nephron. Here we've stretched that nephron out so we can see its full length. And um, you can again see the, the color coding of different uh, functional cell types um, along uh, the length of these um, nephrons from the blood filter to the tubule that will uh, undergo those processes of reabsorption and secretion, and then um, ductal regions that will similarly um, undergo uh, some processes of reabsorption and secretion, but also uh, be responsible for, um, ex for escorting the, the waste out of the body. So when acute kidney injury happens um, from uh, toxins such as an antibiotic that gets into the kidney um, or lack of oxygen, so that would be this um, type of uh, injury from ischemia, those kinds of um, agents will lead to the destruction and, um, and death of cells that are uh, sitting in that kidney tubule. And um, in uh, over time, um, as I um, said earlier, some people will show a return to kidney function um, and through work um, in rodent models and in, um, in others like the zebrafish, um, people now appreciate that there is some endogenous capacity of our nephron tubules to produce new cells and uh, restore that integrity of the nephron. So although there is evidence that this happens, it's not very robust in people. Um, so there seems to be a very limited ability to, to have this response. Um, and the ways that this is um, all orchestrated, what drives any of these events from happening, um, we're at very early stages of understanding that. Um, and so the way I, I frame this is to, um, think about it as, as, a, as a puzzle. There are many different aspects here that we need to solve. Um, so you know, why does AKI differ across people? Why does some bounce back in a week and others have permanent kidney damage? Right? There's actually you know, that range of, of outcomes from these kinds of, um, of medical um, events that occur. Um, but um, uh, by far, um, I think it's... Um, uh, super important to understand what are the mechanisms? How could you induce this process? If you understand how this comes about naturally, could you alter the environment in a person to stimulate, you know, to make it a pro-regenerative kind of um, context after different types of um, injuries or following different types of um, inherited um, diseases? So if we can understand um, how these events happen, um, that opens up opportunities for um, clinical interventions. So um, here we're now gonna turn to the fish and I'll, I'll remind you that uh, we've got our, our mammalian um, kidney here. So a kidney that would be present um, in a human say or a mouse. Um, in the zebrafish, both in the embryo um, 
and the adult. These are drawings not to scale. Okay, the embryo is very, very small, a few millimeters. Um, the adult um, zebrafish will be one and a half to two inches uh, from tip to tail. Um, but what these um, different stages of life in the zebrafish have in common with uh, people um, and other mammals is that they have many of the same cell types. They don't have them all. So the nephron isn't precisely the same composition. Um, but uh, many are conserved, particularly those that are easily damaged. So cells that comprise the blood filter um, and these early regions in the tubule, the so-called proximal tubule, these epithelial cells that sit in those locations, they're the first to be exposed to things that are in our blood. So they are on the front line of um, um, receiving a dose of an antibiotic that is actually in our bloodstream. So those are the cells which are, um, uh, the most likely to be damaged um, and destroyed. And it is in fact um, injury at those particular locations, which is associated with the beginnings of uh, many types of, of acute, of, of um, acquired um, kidney conditions in people. So uh, the bottom line here is that since the zebrafish uh, throughout its life um, has this exhibits this conservation of cell types in, in kidney nephrons, we have an opportunity to utilize this animal model to um, try and, and understand more about that, the basic processes of how you make these cell types um, and also um, how these cells might respond to different kinds of injuries. So um, what's amazing about zebrafish is that they can undergo two kinds of regenerative feats. So in mammals, um, Again, it's thought that the tubules that are present in the body have some limited capacity to undergo repair processes to repair injured cells that don't um, that aren't completely destroyed and to replace cells. So repair and regeneration. Um, but in people, we're born with a certain number of nephrons, and that's what we got. That is our deck of nephrons that we have um, to work with over the course of our life. So we're, we're going to be born with a certain number and we only have attrition. We only have loss of, of them uh, in terms of their functionalities as we age. Um, but um, fish have two things that they can do. So just like um, humans, um, they can fix injured nephrons. They can undergo that kind of tubule uh, repair regeneration that I was uh, illustrating. But fish can make new nephrons when they're adults. So way after um, the time of birth, they can add and, and um, produce new nephron structures in their bodies. And this is, this is just utterly amazing. Now, they're not the only fish that can do this. Lots of, of fish and, and a number of other species can do this as well, um, some of which I've listed here. Um, but this is very distinct from mammals. Um, when a human is born, no more nephrons. When a mouse is born very early um, in the neonatal period, uh, there will be some nephrons made, um, but it's very limited in time. So uh, the fact that fish can make entirely new nephrons, this is this would be something we would want to be able to do in order to treat um, kidney conditions in people if we could do it in a way that wouldn't cause other um, harmful side effects, such as you know, induce cancer in the organ, for example. So um, to add then to this um, um, concept of um, uh, repair and regeneration, Again, zebrafish, if there's damage in a tubule, they'll have cells which will be newly produced, which will um, help to um, reinstate that area. But at the same time, and partially overlapping with that, there are um, renal, what are thought to be renal stem cells. We refer to them as renal progenitors because we don't have all the evidence that they're um, a fully, um, would hit all the definition, um, definitional aspects of being a stem cell. So people refer to them still as a renal progenitor. Um, but these are cells that are existing and associated with the organ, but sit outside the nephron that will start to proliferate. So they'll make a cluster and that cluster will grow and will ultimately make a whole new nephron that will plumb into the existing infrastructure within the kidney. And so this making of new nephrons um, is termed neo for new um, and nephrogenesis for the, the generating, the, the birthing of a nephron. And there were some really beautiful studies in fish um, um, over 20 years ago. There were beautiful studies done in other uh, animals, such as the goldfish. Um, and so um, this citation could um, introduce you to that 
um, that literature, um, but about um, you know, just over 10 years ago now, beautiful studies were done in the zebrafish um, to um, uh, really describe these events and to, for the first time, report them in a really yeah. um, thorough way. Oh, do I have a question? Yeah. Okay, I'll keep going. Uh, so, uh, so in, in these particular studies um, done in the Hildebrandt um, and Davidson labs, um, they did um, really beautiful work to um, annotate that these events happen um, in zebrafish as well. So um, I'm gonna, in the next couple slides, just show you a little bit more about um, these events and um, how we can actually look at them um, in, um, in organs. So um, these next examples are from my lab, but you know, not just my lab, but you know, my lab and others have developed lots of ways to visualize cell types. Um, so here we have some sections of, of tissue um, that were stained with histology approaches. And uh, really uh, what I'll emphasize is that there are uh, very strong similarities in these tubules, whether you're talking about a zebrafish or a mouse. So proximal tubules have very similar features um, across these different species, as do the distal tubules, as do um, the, the, the blood filtering units or the glomeruli. Uh, and we have um, not just histology, but other uh, fluorescent ways to uh, identify different cell types and look at them with respect to one another. And so um, these pictures were taken by a really talented um, graduate student in my lab, Chrissy McCampbell, um, who did this as um, part of her master's work, developed these different types of tools to visualize um, cells um, in, um, in the zebrafish kidney and, um, and to use these in regeneration studies. So one of the things that um, Chrissy um, did, and so she um, took these next pictures as well uh, that I'll share with you, um, was to look at the timing, to look at more about the timing of these events that happen in a fish and to add to the descriptions that were first published um, by the Hildebrandt and uh, Davidson labs, add a couple additional um, key points about uh, features of these cells as uh, these events transpire. So um, in the zebrafish, adult kidney here, we have healthy undamaged tissue. And um, if this kidney um, is exposed to high levels of a particular kind of antibiotic, this is an aminoglycoside antibiotic uh, called gentamicin, um, which now um, would typically be given more for topical infections, often for eye infections, it's in eye drops uh, and the like, so that it doesn't get into your bloodstream in high amounts, um, because when it's in the, in the blood and it gets into the kidney, it will dramatically damage and destroy cells that are in the proximal tubule because it's uptaken by those cells and it leads to their death. And those cells will actually be uh, flushed out of the nephrons themselves and end up uh, passing out of the body. And that's actually what you see if you take sections of this kidney um, at that one day post-injury, that the lumens of the tubes here are um, chock full of what are known as casts. I have to move this so you can see the, the text. Um, these um, structures are known as casts because they are um, uh, the parts of cells that have been um, um, uh, that are being flushed out of the um, of the organ um, after the destruction um, of the cells. And you will see as well, I don't have a, a good example here, but you'll see um, basement membranes of these tubules, which will be empty of cells because of this, this mass destruction. What was amazing is that by seven days, so just one week after the injury, there is massive restoration of the proximal tubules within these kidneys. So these um, tubules now have, um, are fully occupied by epithelial cells again. So it's very difficult to find denuded basement membranes or any kind of cast or anything in this type of stage. But um, you also see evidence of um, growing new nephrons and they have this characteristic where um, they uh, are, um, they become very purple with the kind of stain that we uh, put to illuminate the, the cell features here. So they have this basophilic quality. So they, they take up the stain that has this dark purple appearance. So here's an example of a cluster. This S shape um, is a growing nephron akin to these ones that I've shown up here um, in, uh, in the schematic. 
And um, really by 14 days, you can't see evidence of these new nephrons anymore because they've gone from progenitor states to fully different, well, to differentiated statuses, I should say, um, where we can really now at that point uh, distinguish the typical elements of nephrons, blood filters, um, proximal tubules and distal tubules that are indistinguishable from pre-injury. So within two weeks, these animals can completely repair and regenerate the injured tubule and they make new nephrons as well. It's just utterly amazing that they can do this. Um, so um, again, you know, a number of labs study these processes now, and this is a really exciting area of research that I'd encourage anyone to um, um, uh, go into um, in the future um, as you pursue college um, and, and other um, steps in your life. You know, this area, this field, um, it has, you know, there's a lot of room for, for growth and for new discovery, as is in regeneration of, of many other organs and tissues. But of course, my favorite is uh, trying to understand this in the, in the context of the kidney. Um, so I have a couple other, um, maybe just one other set of data I wanted to show you because I didn't want to um, wanted to stick to time as much as I could. Um, and so one thing that we can do in the fish um, is um, try to address that, go back to that question of well, what's, you know, what's directing all this? What's you know, causing these events to happen? What regulates it? What could impact it um, and the like? And so this again is some work um, by um, Christina Campbell. Um, from, again, from her master's thesis in my lab a few years ago, where she started to parse out different molecular features of these cells and um, compared to an untreated kidney at either three or 14 days post the injury, um, she was able to detect uh, this particular protein that is illuminated here with this, this red um, signal um, in the nuclei. And this is corresponding to the location of a protein that uh, people refer to as PAX2. Um, and I show this because it's a great example of conservation. So when um, tubules um, in mouse models have been studied, they similarly show the expression of this particular protein, which is, encodes a transcription factor. Um, and it's thought that this is um, an important part of the process of um, that repair regeneration of the tubule. And so this uh, really highlights um, another parallel between fish um, and other animals. Okay, so um, with, um, um, uh, with that, I'll say that the continuing work of, of my lab and, and again, others, there are great researchers um, in this area that I'm happy to uh, direct you to um, as well, um, uh, you know, institutions across the United States um, and across the world that are looking at and trying to understand the different signaling pathways, the different molecules like PAX2 and others, you know, what do they do in the process of, of these events? What are they essential for? Um, and to um, design ways that you could um, further uh, utilize these different kinds of animal platforms to um, understand mechanism and um, test different types of therapeutics. So again, uh, uh, just a, a couple sort of closing remarks before we open the floor for, for questions. I just want to uh, remind you about the devastating um, load across the world of these um, kidney conditions that I've talked to you a little bit about uh, today. And that is that one in seven people are affected by some kind of chronic kidney disease in their life. Um, and many more, um, 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 unfortunately, are predicted to do so unless we can find ways to uh, further um, improve and protect kidney health um, over lifetime, over our lifetime. Um, but people using animal models like I was talking about today, as well as a lot of exciting in vitro models are trying to understand how you could grow new nephrons, whether it's in the body or um, in a culture dish. And over here on the right, this is a beautiful picture from um, a really exciting paper that was um, one of the, the, the leading papers in this area where they were creating um, small kidneys in a dish. So this is known as an organoid and people do this kind of work with a lot of different cell types and, um, uh, and organs where they uh, work with a stem or progenitor cell um, and um, identify the context in which they can cultivate that cell 
to grow and make a miniature organ that can be studied. And so you're actually looking here at a miniature kidney that was grown in culture where the different um, sort of almost looks like confetti here. These different colors correspond to different cell types. And um, it's there have been amazing advances in the ability to grow um, um, renal organoids that look that have nephrons that look and have many of the features that th those in our bodies do. It's not a perfect match yet, but people are getting closer and closer um, all the time. And so this is just one more approach to uh, to try and understand you know how are nephrons made? How could you um, potentially make replacement organs? And could you you know ultimately um, transfer these kinds of, of structures uh, to a person in order to to try and ameliorate or abrogate you know, a, either a birth defect or an acquired disease. Um, so both in animals and in, in vitro um, systems, there are a lot of um, exciting opportunities to make inroads um, into this global health problem. Okay, and so with that, I just want to thank everyone for um, attending and participating today. And I'm really happy to open the floor and take questions. Um, and um, I look forward to it. So thank you again, and let's open the floor. Thank you so much for the amazing presentation. So um, we will now begin the Q&A section. We're going to first start with the questions that were asked through the registration form, and then we'll go to any questions that were asked in the Zoom chat. Um, this is your opportunity to ask questions, so please ask whatever you have in your mind. Um, so the first question we got is, in what ways can we make this regenerative medicine accessible to lower income countries and cities? Yeah, so this is something that... Um, um, you know, a lot of us in research and in medicine think about, you know, if we can create a therapeutic or potential therapeutic, you know, how do we make that accessible to, to everyone where there isn't, uh, it's not prohibitive where you are at or what you can afford to pay. And so I think that, um, you know, in my lifetime, I've seen a lot of um, uh, great advances in terms of um, um, private and public sector business um, being really motivated to take product to, um, to the people who need it and to eliminate those, um, those hurdles of getting access to different types of medicine. And so um, it would be, um, you know, I think that it's something we can achieve to identify ways to treat and make it um, accessible to everyone. But it really, in my opinion, requires those partnerships of private and public sectors um, and a lot of open communication across countries and, and to eliminate those um, those lines between different um, between different um, um, countries, um, so that um, yeah, it's something that anyone finds can can be shared with the world. Yeah. Thank you so much for that answer. The next question we have is, how should we dissolve any stigma towards stem cell uh, therapy in the medical field? Yeah, so I think um, the notion of stigmas and and stem cell therapies and questions about um, the effectiveness and safety of a stem cell therapy um, are, are essential for biomedical research to address. And you know, we want to, to harness that hope and that captivating idea that stem cell treatments could be very powerful ways to, to address disease um, in people. But of course, we, we don't wanna be exposing people to undue risk or to elements that we we, we don't know the possible outcomes. And I think often the first thing that jumps to people's mind is, you know, if you're treating a condition with, you know, a stem cell that um, has lots of uh, the ability to make many different offspring, you know, how do we corral that? We want that to be controlled in some way. We don't want it to go haywire and cause cancer. Um, and historically people have also questioned, you know, where did that stem cell come from? Did that come from um, a a person, for example, who could have an informed consent about, about um, what that cell is going to be um, used for. So I think the, the stigmas about therapies anchor in those two aspects of um, being able to ensure um, the safety and minimize risk in any kind of cell therapy, which we have to do with very careful experimentation and thorough, really thorough testing. Um, and um, that question of the sort of the ethics of where a cell came from, we've made huge inroads, you know, as a, you know, again, as, as in terms of the field of science, 
because of the ability uh, and the discovery that, um, that several scientists made led by uh, Shinani Yamanaka and others um, who identified that uh, you could induce stem cell states from cells in the adult body. And so the ability to do that bypasses the use of um, embryos, so human embryos as an example, um, and opens the avenue for personalized treatments, you know, taking a, a skin cell from my body and use, could you use that to make um, some replacement nephrons um, in a dish to, to treat my kidney disease, say I, I would have that um, in the future. So, you know, that would be, I think, um, the, um, the ideal that researchers would like to be able to get to, to take something that could be patient matched and um, and have informed consent and in an efficient way, robust way, that's not gonna lead to cancer or some other kind of, of disease, um, you know, create some kind of cellular therapy to, um, to treat a condition. So I think um, those are the, you know, the things we have to continue to work on is that risk factor. But I think the other with the, the source of the stem cells, I think we have a, you know, a great path forwards there because of the discovery of induced pluripotency. Thank you for that response. Um, so the next question we got is, why did you decide to go into your specific field? Um, I mean, for me personally, I fell in love with developmental biology in college. It was the first, uh, I wanted to study biology. It was the first elective you were allowed to take at my college without having other prereqs because you have usually to go through the paces of taking a bunch of core classes. Um, I took developmental biology and I just loved it. And I've remained fascinated by it ever since. And so I um, was able to study uh, blood cell development when I was in graduate school. And then um, a colleague was going to start a lab on the kidney and uh, had these questions about how do you make different kidney cells and had the idea that zebrafish could, could get you to some of those answers. And uh, I thought it was a really exciting um, and novel opportunity. And uh, so I really entered the field because I thought that zebrafish would be a way to get at the genetics of how you make different nephron cell types. Um, and, um, and I liked the challenge of the complexity that there are so many things to answer, so many cells to understand. Um, and I thought you, you, people need to try and take that kind of challenge on. So I found that um, it, it's a big challenge, but I also found it really exciting. So I, um, that's what motivated me. Yeah, and our next question actually transitions pretty well from there. And someone asked, what would you say brings you the most joy in your line of work? Um, my greatest source of joy is in working with my students, working with my graduate students and my undergraduates, you know, giving them the chance to, um, the opportunities to learn and to discover new knowledge and add to our understanding of how you make cell types, whether it's development or the regeneration processes. Um, for me, it's, it's really all about my lab and, um, um, and the, the people in it. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, so we also had a very similar question asked in chat to that. So um, that kind of hits two questions at the same time. Okay. Um, the next question is, what are some of the struggles that you face in your career? Struggles that I face. Um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is just there's only so much time. There's only so many hours of the day, and there's so many things you want to be able to do. And um, I I wish there were more than 24 hours. I wish there was more time. I love it. You just have to um, utilize your time the best you can. Um, I wish it was unlimited. I've always there used to be a series of commercials where you could there'd be like a big red button you could push. I wish you could just stop like halt time sometimes and you know hit that button and go do things for a long time and then start you know officially restart right. Um, but um, as humans, we you know we have a certain longevity. We have to just deal with that. But I wish there was more time. Yeah, yeah, it's a great answer and. Uh, our final question from the registration form was, how has COVID-19 affected your current uh, career work? Um, yeah, COVID-19 was certainly an unexpected blip for most of us on the planet. Um, you know, it, it slowed us down for a while when we had an, you know, initial responses where we, we, we had to close our lab. And, um, and then when we were able to reopen, we had you know, limited um, 
capacity and we had to spread hours out and such. So it certainly slowed us down um, in, with regard to on the ground experiments. Um, but you know, my, my students were very resourceful. They found ways to use that time to study and to, you know, to grow their own skills. And so on balance, I think um, the frustration of not being able to like do some of the experiments was there was there was a, a benefit of using the time to study and think and um, they both have a, an important place and a role to play so I think um, I um, with any challenge you just have to do your best every day is a new day you just start it again and 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 you know crank it and do the best you can and, and then hopefully you get another chance tomorrow so yeah, thank you for that. So um, the next question that we had is what sparked your interest? Um, these were asked through the yeah, Zoom chat. Exactly. So what sparked your interest in re researching specifically zebrafish? Yeah, um, when I was in that class in college, actually, that development class, um, our professor, um, Dr. Elizabeth McCain, she was awesome. She still is awesome. Um, uh, she would have she had us reading literature. So we read about um, research that was done using the fly, the Drosophila fruit fly, um, as a way to understand the genes that control development. And I, I loved that stuff. I didn't understand it. I understood like a little part of it, to be honest, but because um, I was struggling to learn, you know, to learn how to read papers and such. Um, but um, although I, I felt like I only understood part, only did, um, it was fascinating. And uh, the there were two main authors on the work that we read. Um, one was, uh, her, her name is Christine Nusslein Volhard and the other is Eric Weichhaus. And they won the Nobel prize for discovering how you could um, utilize animals to study the genetic basis of development. And so she did seminal work in the fly and in her career, um, she then turned to like, how else can we advance our understanding of humans? A fly is quite different from a human. So can we find something in between? And so she was interested in other vertebrate models and her, uh, both both um, Dr. Nusslein Volhard and others started, um, they, they came across the zebrafish as, as a great model. Some people were using it already out in Eugene, Oregon, um, but uh, she turned her attention to that model next. So I heard about that um, when, as, as I researched her when I was in college and I thought, I got to I got to try that. I want to see what the zebrafish is about. And if she was doing it, I thought, that's like good enough for me. I just got, I just was very inspired by her work. And, um, and I, I just, I really wanted to try that out when I got to grad school and I was lucky enough to have an opportunity to work in a zebrafish lab and, and it was awesome. Uh, and, um, and again, the lab had very inspiring. His name is Dr. Lenzon and he did amazing work in the blood field and, and has since expanded to, to cancer and some other topics, but, um, yeah, it, it came from reading scientific papers and admiring a scientist and then seeing what they studied next. And that's sort of how I found it. And um, the notion that you could use them for biomedical research just always has always blown me away because they are quite different from us, but they're so fundamentally the same that you, know, you can do a lot with um, the powers of genetics in, in the model. So. That was very informative. Uh, thank you so much. And the next question in the Zoom chat was, how does nephron structure change across species or do all species have the same standard nephron structure? If so, if nephron structure is the same across species, why do you think evolution has preserved similar structures across different species? Yeah, so um, there are many similarities in nephron structure across species, but certainly there are, there are significant differences as well. So I'll give you just one example. Um, the sake of time. Um, and that is, um, if we compare the zebrafish to a mammal, zebrafish don't have um, segments that are referred to as the loop of Henle, which are important for water conservation. So they ultimately, um, the, ultimately those segments lead um, to the ability to concentrate the urine. Um, and fish, th these fish are are swimming in water and it's fresh water. So they don't have an, a, a, set, a huge necessity to concentrate their urine. They don't need to go through the energetics of that kind of a process. Um, and so they don't have that segment. It correlates with their, um, with their environment. 
we do, we have that loop of Henley and it's super important when you're terrestrial in order um, to be able to live on land, you have to be able to conserve your water um, and to do so really effectively. So that's a big difference between um, fish and people. Um, to my knowledge, I don't know uh, evolutionarily if people have landed on the answer as to the basis of that difference. You know, did fish, for example, um, never evolve that or did they have it and then they trashed it? They got rid of it over evolution because they don't actually need it. So there was no, you know, inducement to, to keep that structure. So I don't know the answer to that. It might be known, but I don't know it. Um, but it you know, brings up a great question that there are unique differences. Um, some animals don't even have the, a blood filter in, in the way that um, that I was describing. And so there are um, fascinating evolutionary questions that you can, um, that you can pursue in this, in this area that I don't know all the answers to, but uh, they're definitely fascinating. Thank you so much for that response. And the last question that we received through the Zoom chat was, how are youth kidneys different from mature kidneys? And can the kidneys in both regenerate? Yeah. So, um, it's a great, it's a, a great question as, as all the others have been. Um, I, I think the best way for me to answer that is to say that um, there has been uh, over the last few years, a growing appreciation of um, the differences in cells as we age. And the notion that uh, a cell that in my body at my age um, in mid forties of what that mature cell type looks like is likely very different from what those same cells looked like at earlier stages in my you know, so-called adult life. Um, we don't, but although people appreciate that there are differences uh, as we age and as we mature, um, the exact differences aren't fully understood and appreciated either. But for example, when people grow organoids in a dish, they know they're not fully what are called differentiated. They don't have all the same attributes, all the same bells and whistles that um, a nephron cell would have in a young mouse, for example. Um, but um, but there are this, uh, this other layer of um, unique changes that are happening as, as our organs mature. And um, there's just a lot of research to be done in that area. Um, as I said, it's a sort of a newfound kind of appreciation of that aspect um, that, all cells are not created equal, even if it's a proximal tubule cell, you know, age 10 versus 15 versus 45 or 80, there are, are going to be differences. So um, I think that's sort of a challenge for, I would say, you know, certainly continuing research, but especially your generation, I think trying to figure out like that answering that puzzle, I think will be a, a really exciting uh, thing to be able to do. So. So thank you so much for all those great answers. We once again like to thank Dr. Winger for taking her time today to give us an introduction to her work. And thank you all so much for attending today's presentation. And please use the link posted in chat to obtain your shattering certificate. Thank you all so much for attending and we look forward to seeing you in our next meeting.